this is the this is the uh June 1st, 2023, Des Moines Area Metropolitan Planning Organization Transportation Technical Committee. Uh, we'll call this uh, June 1st meeting to order. Uh, I get some notifications here. All right, so first, uh, uh, Tracy, thank you for sending out the agenda. Can I get a, uh, a motion and a second to approve the agenda, please? Terms, I'll move approval of the agenda. Thank you, Madeline. Just Rudy, I'll second. Thanks, Rudy. All right, we have a motion and a second. And again, for those, if there's folks that are new, uh, you know, we are doing this meeting online, so we will not, we're not gonna have everyone on mute and say aye. We're just gonna ask if anyone is opposed to the motion. So is anyone uh, have any uh, questions on, on this uh, motion? Is anyone opposed? the motion. Okay, hearing none, uh, the agenda is approved. Item three is a, uh, I'm uh, looking at the May 4th uh, committee, technical committee meeting minutes. Uh, can I get a uh, motion and a second, please, on those minutes? Moved, Huseman. Thanks, Chelsea. Ms. Rudy, I'll second. Thanks, Rudy. All right, we got a motion and a second. Does anyone have any questions or comments on the meeting minutes? Okay, is anyone opposed to the motion? Okay, hearing none, thank, thank you so much, uh, Tracy, for getting those out. Uh, that item is approved. That motion passes. All right, uh, that brings us to item four, uh, presentation on transportation innovative financing. Uh, Andrew, are you able to, to talk on this one? Yes, thank you. Uh, today, we are lucky to have uh, Rajiv De Cruz, a senior policy analyst from Federal Highway Administration. I apologize if I got that name wrong. I tried my best there. No, you did great. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so here, uh, to talk about just the different types of potential financing options that are available. It's their label is innovative. Um, hopefully we're getting that presentation kind of switched over right now. Um, I'll turn it over to him. Um, I appreciate uh, you taking your time to, to present to us. Thank you. Sounds great. Okay, give me one minute. Let me try to hopefully share my screen successfully. Okay, um, can everybody see my screen? Can anybody see my screen? Not, not, not yet. yet. I'm still still seeing you, Rajiv. Yep. Okay. Um, give me one one second. So that was, oh, okay. I, I had to click share. That was the problem. Okay. Sorry. Give me one minute again. All right. Is there anybody? We go. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you everybody for um, allowing me to present today. My name is Rajiv DeCruz. I work at the Federal Highway Administration in the Center for Innovative Finance Support. Um, so I wanted to give a, a brief presentation on innovative finance. And I also just want to caveat one thing is that um, I am relatively new to the office, so I'm still learning about a lot of these innovative finance tools. However, I do work with a lot of people that have extensive experience um, you know, in, in these topics and have a lot of um, a really large depth of knowledge. So throughout the presentation, I definitely encourage you to ask any questions you want and any questions I'm not able to answer, um, I will take back to you and I'll get an answer for you. So sound good? Okay. Um, so <clears throat> this is, uh, uh, this presentation is about how transportation professionals can utilize innovative finance to leverage existing federal resources. Uh, one more uh, just quick note is that I cannot see any uh, questions in the chat pod. So either Andrew or Stephen, if uh, we do get any questions, can you just interrupt me and, and let me know? Okay. Absolutely. Yep. Thanks. So I want to talk about three things during our uh, during this presentation. One is about innovative finance techniques. The other is a briefing book uh, for planners on innovative finance, and the third is other resources that are available. So first, what is innovative finance? So there are specially designed techniques and tools that supplement traditional highway finance methods, improving government's ability to deliver transportation projects. So traditionally, 
transportation agencies have used grant-based funding from the federal government and then matched it with their own funds to pay for transportation investments. However, today, agencies are increasingly expanding the type of funding sources that they use. Innovative finance allows transportation agencies to deliver transportation in creative ways through financing and other non-traditional funding options. By using innovative finance techniques, transportation agencies may be able to expand the program's reach and increase their buying power. So this infographic here highlights some of the differences between innovative finance and traditional pay-as-you-go methods. So if you look on the, in the green um, column, with innovative finance, you have the advantage of start starting building immediately. And that means then you can build without delays. In addition, um, on average, this is just a, an estimate. Uh, if you're financing, you could take an amount of a roughly an interest rate of 3.25% over 10 years. Now, obviously that rate could change, but that's just an average amount. And then the, the project could be completed in three to five years. Now, if you contrast that with the pay-as-you-go method in the purple column, you may have to wait five years to start building due to budget restrictions. In addition, you have to sometimes build in phases as the funds become available. And the downside with that is that while you're waiting, the uh, uh, construction costs can rise with the price of inflation, sometimes 4% annually. And also projects take uh, longer, maybe eight to 10 years to complete. So you could potentially save about $150,000 using innovative finance relative to pay as you go. So I want to talk about two key terms when we talk about innovative finance. There's financing and then there's funding. Financing is borrowing from, excuse me, borrowing funds. So this could take the form of bonds, loans, public-private partnerships. Funding, on the other hand, is supplementing the revenue that you're raising. So this can be through uh, techniques such as value capture and tolling. Innovative finance comprises of both the financing and the funding side. And sometimes these techniques can be paired or used concurrently. This next slide here has um, some examples that are on our website. And I'll share the link to our website after this presentation of uh, various innovative finance, project, uh, innovative finance projects um, across the nation. So there's Garvey, Tipia, Tolling Pricing, Value Capture, CMGC and SIG. Um, I don't have time during this presentation to go through all the different of what all these different types of financing are. But again, I'm gonna direct you to our website and, and some videos that actually uh, give a really great um, explanation of, of what all these things are in case you are new to any of them. So why should innovative finance be considered in the planning process? So there are four main reasons. One is to leverage existing funding. So um, agencies may find that they can apply innovative finance in particular settings and allocate their grant funding for situations requiring their funds. And that in this way ensures that available funds are put to the most, best use. The second is expediting project delivery. So um, as notes, you can keep costs down by increasing efficiency. Transportation agencies may deliver more projects in the same period of time using innovative finance techniques in addition to traditional pay-as-you-go methods. Delivering projects more cost-effectively and efficiently may also have positive impacts to the communities, such as receiving safety upgrades sooner and providing opportunities for economic growth. Another reason that one should consider innovative finance in the planning process is to increase stakeholder and public awareness. So um, innovative finance techniques may often be new concepts to the public and other stakeholders. Stakeholders, By providing information about these methods early on in the planning process, particularly as part of an existing outreach for transportation plans and programs, transportation agencies can allow for greater understanding of these techniques, increase the likelihood of stakeholder buy-in. It's important to convey both the benefits as well as the cost of using innovative finance techniques to stakeholders. And finally, <clears throat> the last reason to consider innovative finance in the planning process is to encourage innovation. So by exploring innovative finance techniques, 
transportation agencies tap into a culture where innovation is inherently part of the process. Incorporating these techniques directly into the transportation pro process pro further formalizes this integration and encourages ways to maximize and leverage existing funding in new and different ways. So the next slide uh, talks about how innovative finance fits into the transportation planning process. And you can see this applies whether it's MPOs, RTPOs, travel government, state DOTs. So for the MPO, this gets factor in in the metropolitan trans transportation plans and the transportation improvement plans and the unified planning workforce programs. All this information is actually covered more in depth in the briefing book. And so what is the briefing book? So the Innovative Finance for Planners Briefing Book is a companion to the uh, Office of Planning's Transportation Planning Process Briefing Book. Um, the Center for Innovative Finance Support approves this briefing book to serve as a resource for transportation agencies looking for information on innovative finance techniques, their application within the transportation planning process. With this document, CIFS, or Center, Center for Innovation, Innovative Finance Support aims to increase transportation agencies' awareness of these techniques. While transportation agencies may typically consider the use of innovative finance as primarily for larger transportation projects, this briefing book aims to demonstrate there's a variety of techniques to use, excuse me, a variety of ways to use these techniques in support of planning, programming, and funding for transportation projects, no matter their size. There's two main parts to this book. The first gives an overview of innovative finance and transportation planning. And then the second part drills down into innovative finance techniques. So who's the audience for this briefing book? Oh, um, excuse me, sorry, I went to the wrong side. Oh, excuse me, sorry. There we go, okay. <laughs> um, uh, so it's, this is geared to planning staff at MTOs, RTPOs, tribes, who are interested in starting conversation about innovative finance techniques or looking for new ways to enhance their existing budgets and resources. So planning staff at these um, agencies are increasingly involved in finance discussions or financing discussions or strategy for transportation projects. By having planners more aware of the possibilities offered by innovative finance techniques, planners and finance managers within an agency can better identify opportunities earlier on in the, in the planning process and strengthen the coordination in applying these techniques. So I've talked about what I've given an overview of innovative finance. I talked about the briefing book. Um, and finally, I just wanted to turn your attention to some more resources that you can turn to um, if you want to learn more. So there's the CIF, uh, CIFS webpage for planners and communities. There's a really excellent video series, which I've actually been uh, watching just to understand, okay, what exactly is a Garvey and what's a Tiffia, et cetera. So for people that are new to these concepts, I think it's really helpful. And then finally, there are innovation profiles, specific examples of um, projects that use innovative finance techniques. And um, here is Pete's contact information. As I mentioned, Pete is my uh, director. And if you have um, any questions, for, you can feel free to reach out to him uh, directly. But I, that is my presentation. I'm just going to stop there and see if anybody had um, anything they want to ask. Rajiv, are there any questions for Rajiv? OK, I'm going to try to stop screen sharing. Sorry, I can't. No worries. Oh, OK. Am I still screen sharing? Oh, it says I am. OK, sorry. Yeah, it's, it, oh, there you okay. go. Yeah. Great. Okay. okay. Rajiv, was there a link? You mentioned there was a link that there were, uh, you were, or I don't know if you're able to post it in the chat or maybe, or yeah. if nothing else, if you could uh, get it to Andrew, he could post it too. Um, for us. But, yeah, yeah, we'll be sending out the slides and many of the links that were discussed after the, after this meeting. So thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. All right. Rajiv, well, thank you so much for the presentation. We really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you also sharing it with us so we can get those the links as well. So thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And again, please uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions and we'll do our best to help. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, that brings us to item five, uh, which is a uh, presentation on the Iowa DOT regional projects update. 
Uh, Dylan, are you able to? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll kick this off. Um, thanks, Steve. I'll kick this off. Uh, typically, we have the Iowa DOT present uh, their upcoming projects within the region in June. We do this a little bit of ahead of the tip. That way, you, you know, there's a lot of DOT things that go into the tip, and it's also just a good time of year to get a sense of all the various projects you see as construction gets going around the metro. So Andy from District 1 will walk us through what they've got going on. Thanks, Dylan. And uh, it's good to be here and talk again. Uh, we have a lot going on. I've picked out pretty much the bigger projects. I don't think we need to all go through, you know, 100 bridge deck repairs and things like that. So picked out the larger projects and you know, you guys can feel free to get out there if you have questions about things as it relates to yours. If I don't talk to it uh, about it, you can go to the uh, five-year program and, and or, you know, ask me if you got some questions. So, um, come on now. Okay, there we go. So, District 1 is, you know, 12 counties in Central Iowa. We've talked about this a lot. Down in your area, we have uh, four maintenance garages. Uh, we have uh, our operations managers down there, and we have a resident construction office over in Grimes that handles a good majority of the work down there. Sometimes there's too much work going on in the metro, and we bring in Marshalltown or Jefferson to help out a little bit. Uh, this is our tree of folks here. Um, you guys have heard Tony Gustafson's name. He was the assistant before, been here several years as the engineer. Allison took his job and moved up. Um, we do have a new uh, addition as Andy Swisher as the uh, TISMO engineer. He was formerly with uh, Howard R. Green and has come to us about a month ago. Um, we had a retirement of John Narragon, who you guys probably all knew as a local area engineer of our South area. He's uh, retired and been replaced with Ben 80, who was our North area engineer. So. You guys may have worked with him some in the past, but definitely anything John was doing, he'll be taking over. And then Gary Cretlow, our uh, traffic tech, and you guys probably know him too as it relates to signs and signals. So I'll talk a little here on the uh, uh, our initiatives for the district. And, um, you know, we have safety, stewardship, and operations at the top, um, you know, as our, our overarching um things that we want to work on but safety you know obviously our employees out there we've been doing quite a few things to help there with uh, adding chevrons to the tailgates and things like that and they i think that's been been pretty effective and you know making sure that when we're doing moving operations we have lots of folks out there and i don't know you probably have heard the audi audible attenuators those help out quite a bit if folks uh get too close and don't heed the flashing lights, then they hit them with the sound. And sounds like you're in England and the police are following you from probably miles away. It's real loud. So the stewardship, you know, we're just trying to keep interstate um, and not just maintaining it, but also, you know, providing capacity improvements where we need. And you can see in the background there of the Northeast mix. And I'll talk a little more about that later. Um, the uh, operations, you know, we work a lot with that on you guys as we get down to the intersection level and, uh, you know, with signals and things like that. And we've been trying to work on bottlenecks and, and to be resilient, um, you know, to those uh, environmental things out there. So our on ongoing projects, the larger ones, uh, US 69, that uh, two lane to five lane conversion should be completed in 2023. Uh, it's been a long time coming. We had a long backup with some utilities and we're trying to, even in new projects, trying to stay on top of the utilities more and more. Um, we have the six laning of uh, I-35 from Ankeny up to down about three miles north of Iowa 210. You guys, if you've traveled north, I'm sure you've seen that. Got a few pictures from our drone here, but uh, that's, uh, we have about, uh, 100 million programmed or well no 170 million on that uh, on that portion so it'll be a full reconstruction to six lanes um, doing the two uh, new or the, excuse me the three new southbound lanes first and then uh, switch traffic to that while we build the new northbound lanes 
Uh, right this year, the Elkhart interchange is is down to be re <clears throat> reconstructed, and then next year will be Iowa 210. So kind of alternated those to not affect everyone and give a contractor, you know, space to build instead of trying to do half the time or something like that. And then there's just the full display of that. I thought about taking it out, but it does show we acquired right away on the west side there or on the top of this diagram west is or yeah west is on the top of those as they lay there yeah 171 million so that should help out quite a bit then just south of that at the uh uh northwest mix we've been working out there for a good portion of last winter setting up and uh as you can see, we have quite a few cranes out there. And if you guys have traveled out there and missed that, I, I don't know how. Um, we've been doing a lot of work and, I, you know, this is gonna be a huge improvement there to get rid of those left off ramps to the Minneapolis ramp as we called it. And, uh, you know, just to modernize this, this interchange. And that was like a $70 million project and should be completed in uh, 2025. Then I'll talk about our uh, program projects kind of scattered throughout, um, kind of on the peripheries, but I'll uh, discuss those here. So just to the east of that uh, Northwest or Northeast mix is a uh, capacity improvement that will tie into that. As you can see the top diagram there, the, uh, the gray um, line is the new Minneapolis east westbound to uh, northbound 35 ramp and that will tie in we're just finishing the uh that bridge deck there for the up railroad on that ramp but this will help with this congestion area we have uh you know chronic backups there operations issues and uh should be 25 to 2027 right now is what the commission has us programmed at then uh, talk about the US 69 improvements. We've been working with the city of Des Moines, trying to figure something out at Maury. Um, and whoops, back, hold on a second. And uh, then we have an upcoming project over the uh, Des Moines River there, the bridge replacement. And we're trying to coordinate those together. However, our commission slipped the Des Moines River project out to 2027. 20, so I don't know how that works, Steve, but we'll have to talk about that a little bit, uh, keep going with that. But it's, uh, you know, the bridge is something, our bridge department, you know, they they crunch their numbers and this just came up to need be replaced. And we want to try to try to coordinate those projects. And as you know, the US 6 uh, Hickman Road interchange at 3580 is uh, being replaced and repaired, or excuse me, replaced and uh, capacity added to the uh, interstate there as it, in the form of auxiliary lanes between Douglas and University. And that 100, about $100 million program for that in 2024, starting with right away and through 2028. Gonna be a full reconstruction, um, you know, leaving, leaving the majority of the movements open at most of the time. So it's going to be, you know, kind of a phasing nightmare, but you can also see the purple lines there that we're incorporating, working with the local communities to uh, make bike connections and make those worthwhile as we get through this interchange. And, um, you know, that, that helps into the future. We don't have to try to anticipate what, you know, where we might want to go. So this really helps out with that. And they'll be doing some, uh, some uh, natural, some, enhancements along there as well. So cities asked us to to make it nice when we're in there. So they're kind of involved with uh, providing some money to help with some of those aesthetics. And then this uh, I-80 capacity improvement from Jordan Creek, uh, from Grand Prairie Parkway to Jordan Creek Parkway. Um, this looks, is the one that they advanced a couple years ago, and now it looks like they've uh, pushed that back to 2025 starting. So we were going to 2024, but the commission reorganized the, the plan and looks like this district four project will be starting in 2025. But another area that needs to be done and that's programmed is about $45 million. 
this gets me to the south mix or southwest mix and um you guys have known that we were i pretty sure i talked about this the last time or two that we're wanting to you know redo this and get rid of the uh the southbound uh loop ramps on the west side of the interstate and we uh went through a location study and had that uh double checked engineering wise with another firm and um we're working right now on trying to do IJR and get through that process. We'll be coming out to the public uh, early next year to discuss this, but the gist here is getting rid of uh, the uh, southbound 3580 to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, eastbound 235 ramp um, and replace that with a flyover, um, a two, two lane directional flyover ramp. And then the other thing here is, as you can see, kind of on the top of the screen, the uh, switch between the Omaha ramp and uh, extension of 235 into 80 westbound. Uh, what our what our investigation or location study showed is that like more than 75% of traffic coming from 235 was going to Jordan Creek Parkway. So we thought, you know, to get rid of that merge to verge problem, this this alternative was the one that we chose to you know kind of move forward with the IJR so um so that'll be coming out we'll be getting to the public but we have about I think we have everything uh programmed for this first phase here in uh like in I can't quite see my ears there hold on just off my screen I think stop that yeah, 2027, 2028 construction on that. Then this one is, uh, I think the last one I have that to talk about a larger project is uh, the Iowa 141 and uh, 121st Street project. Uh, we just had a public meeting on the 28th, or the, excuse me, on the 18th for this and had quite a bit of uh, resistance from the local communities. So don't know for sure where this will be ending up but the uh the premise on this one was the crash problem at 121st and 141 was uh enough to you know us to join up with the county and try to figure something out there we started with the interchain or intersection warning um signals and uh beacons and stuff out there and that's helped some but it's we still are having crashes out there at this high speed uh, you know, at grade intersection. So this diagram will show shows basically to uh, to close off 121st North and, you know, provide access here to the south because we have homes that need access from here, but replace that access there with a new road, uh, 110th Street named as off of one, uh, excuse me, off 415. So um residents in these neighborhoods over there were you know not not real happy with this even though we've shown it you know we had uh had this was our fourth public meeting on it we had a little bit of delay there because of you know through covid and stuff like that and just getting back to it but uh we definitely want to work something continue to work on this because we uh you know this the sacred intersection is is not going to get better it's as safety goes you know when traffic increases usually things get worse so we want to try to stay ahead of it and then do you guys have any questions um you know about any of these projects or if if you know on anything else just let me know thank you andy is uh, anyone have any questions for andy Okay, hearing none. Uh, thank you so much, Andy. I appreciate you giving this update. Thank you. No, you're welcome. Yeah. All right. Uh, that brings us to item six: uh, report and a vote on the draft uh, federal fiscal year 2024-2027 uh, transportation improvement program. Uh, Zach, are you able to talk to this one, please? Yes. Thank you. Uh, staff has been spending the last couple months putting together the draft tip for federal fiscal year 24 through 27. Um, that draft has been completed. Um, it was sent out with the reminder email um, yesterday. Uh, 
What we'd request that you do is just take another look at the draft tip, uh, specifically look at the project list um, for your projects. Just make sure that everything is programmed in there correctly. Things are showing up in the correct programming years and that the total amounts and everything looks accurate and correct. Um, please uh, do that over the next few weeks. We will be submitting this to the DOT on June 15th. Um, they will provide their comments to us as well, and we'll incorporate those into the final draft before we submit that um, on July 15th. So if you do uh, review your projects and see some changes that need to be made still, please let us know and we can make those changes as part of the, the final development of the TIP. Um, another thing I would note, um, if you go to the next slide, um, just a comment on fiscal capacity. Um, fortunately, we were able to accommodate everybody's requests as far as what years that they wanted to program their projects in. I would note that in the first couple of years, 24 and 25, we are very low on our fiscal capacity. So we really, um, if there are any additional um, requests to move projects to 24, for example, we would not be able to accommodate those without making some additional changes to the projects that are already listed in 24. Um, you can see there that we have you know, a $30,000 balance. So just not a lot of capacity there to work with to move projects in there. And similar in 25, we have 730,000, but that's still not um, a lot when we're talking about large projects. So just want to make you aware of that, that if you do um, look at your projects and decide that you may have wanted to move one forward into one of those years, that uh, we really won't be able to accommodate that um, in this uh, version of the tip. So um, if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to take them. Otherwise, like I said, this is just the draft. Um, we're having you vote on it so we can send it on to the Iowa DOT. Um, but please do look at your projects and just make sure that everything looks like we have it in there correctly. Does anyone have any questions for Zach? Zach, are you looking for, and you're looking for a vote on that, please? Yes, please. Okay. All right. Do we have a, a motion to uh, uh, approve uh, the federal fiscal year 2024-2027 tip? So moved, Houston. Thanks, Second. Chelsea. Reiner. Thanks, Matt. All right. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Okay. Is anyone opposed? Hearing none, that motion passes. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. Okay, uh, that brings us to item seven, a report and a vote on the charging and fueling infrastructure discretionary grant program. Uh, Carl, are you able to talk to this one, please? Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, just uh, another update on the charging and fueling infrastructure discretionary grant program um, or the CFI that um, the MPO is going after. So this was brought up in March. So kind of a quick turnaround um, but overall, there is um, $700 million available this year and $2.5 billion over the next five years. This is primarily to implement new charging infrastructure. However, it is for other um, um, fueling as well, so hydrogen, natural gas, um, and propane. Uh, there's two different types of grants that we um, are eligible for. Uh, however, we're focusing on the community charging program. Uh, so this prioritizes the rural areas, low and moderate income neighborhoods, um, and um, low uh, private parking and multi-unit dwellings. And the minimum award is 500,000 with a maximum award of 15 million. Um, and we're probably gonna be coming in around the $4 million ask. Um, there's also the alternative fuel corridors, um, which we're not going after this year, but this is a five-year program, so we can um, strategize and go after other um, dollars in the future. Uh, it is an 80-20 um, match, so or global split, so uh, communities will be uh, um, responsible for 20% of the project costs, and um, uh, most of the the primary focus of the the program is safety, climate change, um, equity, uh, justice, 40. Uh, workforce development. Um, so really trying to put these uh, charging, um, the charging infrastructure where it will be used uh, by the community and the, the general public with the applications being due now on June 13th. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is uh, um, what our current uh, charging locations kind of look like on the left of the map there. 
Um, so we're putting together, um, the FBO is leading the charge with the, uh, putting together the community um, application. Uh, this is the first of five years. So we're really looking to just support communities and where they wanted their charges to, to go. Um, and then we'll be looking at more of a, a um, um, looking at implementing the like EV plan over the next five years as we continue to go after uh, more more charging stations. Um, so all communities have been uh, contacted. We're waiting to hear final locations from just a few, but so far 21 communities have gotten their everything into us, but just waiting on the final a few and getting those back by June 6th. Um, yeah, so I think we're looking for just an approval and send this on up to uh, the policy. Okay, thanks, Carl. Is there any, are there any questions for Carl? Okay, and, and I apologize, Carl, the online mapping, that mapping tool you're showing there, that is that, where is that located? I apologize if I missed that. Um, if it wasn't in the agenda, I can go ahead and send that out. Um, if I, it, it, if I apologize, it could be. Yeah. It, it may have been. I apologize. We can include that in the post we email this afternoon. Yeah. Okay. It's very easy for us to get that to you. Thank you. It looks like it. Well, it's hard to say. Yeah. Yep. No, thank you. So thank you. Yeah. And it's a fully inter interactive map um, using S3. Um, so it's fully click clickable and you can look into each charging location. Okay. Awesome. All right, uh, do we have a motion and a second to uh, uh, approve this uh, this grant? Middle. Moved, Huseman. Thanks, Chelsea. Rudy, Rudy, I'll second. Thank you, Rudy. All right, we have a motion and a second. Are there any questions or comments? Is anyone opposed to the motion? Okay, hearing none, consider that motion approved. Thank you, Carl. Thanks. All right, that brings us to item eight. Uh, we've got a report on the 2023 payment condition report. Uh, Andrew, are you able to talk to that one, please? I am, thank you. So since, uh, excuse me, payment data was collected for all paved roads in the MPO planning area in 2021. Um, we've been doing this since 2013. Uh, we're currently in a collection year right now as well, so this data will be updated um, this year. We'll get access to that in 2024, so we'll be able to continue to update um, the committee as as this pavement data becomes available. Um, but basically, we have the we have these vans. You'll probably see them around um, the metro that uh, collect point data about every 60 feet on all paved roads, um, and we that information is then taken to Intrans at Iowa State and turned into a pavement condition index or PCI. Um, for road segments. So I also note the city and county PCIs are calculated differently. Um, county roads typically are faster, uh, have higher uh, speed limits, faster cars. Um, and when you hit a speed bump at 55 miles an hour, uh, it does a lot more damage than at 25 miles an hour, like on a city uh, side street or something like that. So they have different calculations um, baked in there as well. Next slide. So as you may have noticed uh, over the last year, we've been taking a lot of the information, a lot of the reporting that we've done in the past more as uh, static reports and been putting them on into an online format. And I wanna thank Z for uh, taking all this data and then putting it uh, online. I believe a link was included in the agenda packet, but basically uh, this is a snapshot of what you will see online. Um, there on the left, uh, we have different pavement condition information for different communities tracking over time since 2013. We also track progress towards meeting our performance measures and mobilizing tomorrow. Um, and then on the right, we have a mapping feature where you're able to select different jurisdictions, which will zoom into each communities uh, and then update the graph, which shows PCI broken down by federal functional class. So this is a lot of a lot of tools that are available um, online, uh, and I'll kind of go through those uh, briefly right now. Next slide. So as we have in the past, we've been we've we've tracked uh, pavement condition index or PCI data over since 2013. In mobilizing tomorrow, we do have a five year target of a 65 for average pavement condition. Um, as you can see, we are hitting that currently. However, since 2013, we have seen a decline in the overall average PCI for the metro. Um, 
similarly for percentage of which should this should be pavements rather than roads, but percentage of pavement in poor or worse condition, uh, we are hitting our five year target of 8%. Uh, but we are still trending upwards in that category, which is something we don't want to do. Um, but I'll, I'll dive into the data a little bit um, more in depth here shortly to kind of show where that's looking at. So um, here, and it didn't translate super well on the screen, but you can see just the pavement condition uh, conditions for each community from that 21, 2021 data set. Uh, communities like Joaquin and West Des Moines that have newer roads have a higher percentage of their pavements in excellent condition. Older communities uh, with some of those older pavements will have uh, their percentage a little less than that excellent and very good. Um, but you can just see here just how that kind of breaks out across the metro. Next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, in 2021, the average PCI was around 66. Uh, you can see on the graph that that is trending downward over time. And uh, that chart just kind of shows uh, for the MPO how those percentage of pavements breaks out. Um, but this doesn't really tell the, the whole story. This is just a kind of a top level data set. And on the next slide, if you go to that, you can also see that, again, percentage of pavements in poor or worse condi condition trending upward. Uh, culminating in a 12% uh, for 2021, which is not on its face something that's great to see, but there's a little more to it than that. Can you go to the next slide? Quick question, Andrew. Yes. Somewhere in there, there was a formula change for the city PCI. Correct. Has this been corrected for that or? Yes, we we yeah. talked in trans and we had all past pavement data recalculated using the new PCI. So this is an apples to apples comparison for that. Okay, thank you. So on the screen, you can see the uh, average PCI broken out by a federal functional class. And so what you're seeing here is uh, four, excuse me, three out of the four higher level road segments. So other principal arterial, minor arterial, major collector, and minor collector, which is typically county pavements. But four, three out of those four higher level road orders are actually trending upwards. I uh, don't know what's happening with minor arterial. I was kind of surprised to see that, but your local pavements are also decreasing in PCI. So um, what, what we're seeing here since 2013, communities have been doing a lot more pavement management uh, practices, uh, utilizing additional software and, and doing a more systematic approach to uh, pavement preservations. So you see here that things like uh, other principal arterial, for example, that PCI is trending upward in our MPO, even though the overall average PCI is, is declining. Um, a lot, when you're using pavement management techniques, you're, you're, uh, high, you're prioritizing higher classified roads over lower classified roads, which makes sense. On other principal arterial roads or streets, you'll see faster pavement, faster mile, uh, excuse me, faster vehicle traffic, which again, that matters. The PCI matters a lot more when, you're, when your cars and your trucks are going faster. Um, those those other higher level roads as well typically have higher traffic volumes. So again, you're when you're doing your benefit cal benefit cost calculation, those roads with higher traffic volumes will rise to the top, show a better um, benefit cost ratio. And then also these ones typically have tend to have your commercial and industrial um, activity along those corridors. So even within the data set, even though we are showing a lower PCI than we did in 2019, and a higher percentage of pavements in poor and worse condition, we're seeing that stratification of the higher classified roads being increasing PCI, whereas your locals, local roads, where it makes sense to have a little bit lower PCI go down. And this is all in the context of having not enough money. I will say that I, I think everyone knows that no community has enough money to, to maintain all of their roads all the time. So you have to have trade-offs. And as we've kind of adopted more of those pavement management techniques, you're seeing that here um, within the data. And go to the last slide. Um, through calculating everything, we used to calculate utilizing line, uh, excuse me, mile of line roadways, but we've converted that to actual uh, pavement. So um, we can actually look at and see how much pavement is in our metro. And so this last year, we had 14.7 square miles of, of road pavement um, in the MPO area. So to put that in perspective, uh, that just local road pavements is larger than the cities of Altoona, Bondurant, Carlisle, Clive, Grimes, Mitchellville, Norwalk, Pleasant Hill, Polk City, and Windsor Heights. So basically, during, if you took all that pavement, put it together, it would be larger than any of those communities, basically large giant parking lots. 
It's also half the size of Ankeny, 16% the size of Des Moines, 70% the size of Johnston, 65% the size of Urbandale, 70% the size of Waukee, and 30% the size of West Des Moines. And this doesn't include any of the other built as aspects of our built environment, such as actual uh, parking lots or, or uh, buildings or anything like that. This is strictly local paved roads. And so just to give you a perspective of just how big our transportation system really is in the context of things like st stormwater runoff um, or other uh, ancillary um, categories. So that that's a brief report on just the status of our, um, our paved road system. I'd be happy to take any questions anyone may have. Thanks, Andrew. And so you said, you said the, oh, sorry, the, the, the current evaluations are going on right now for 23. So what, when would we have those data? So typically it, it, it takes until about fall of 2024 to get, get all the okay. data. Yeah. It's about a year lag time because sometimes they have to go back and rerun the roads that they missed. And then it takes Intrans quite a bit of time to, you know, recalculate everything and, and bring all that data together. Okay. Okay. Andrew. Yes, John. Um, do you have a is there a rest endpoint with the uh, PCI data that we can grab? We can make that available. Yes, uh, we we just uploaded it online, and we can we can get that to you. Okay, I'll send you an email. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, and this and this data uh, is is available to every, anyone and everyone. I will note to um, the DOT typically only moving forward will collect data every four years. So then the 2021 collection cycle, that is actually something the MPO had to purchase as an add-on. And that's something that we see as a benefit um, to you all, especially uh, since, especially the larger communities, it's pretty difficult to get out there and look at all of your pavement, you know, over the course of a year or two. So um, this collection cycle for 2023, it will be a DOT collection cycle. And then in 2025, we hope to opt in as well to get that additional information. So just wanted to make that uh, aware to everyone. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, any additional questions for Andrew? Okay, you're not. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, that brings us to item nine, a report on the Comprehensive Safety Action Plan RFP update. Uh, Zach, are you able to talk to this one, please? Yes, thank you. I just want to provide you with a brief update on the Comprehensive Safety Action Plan RFP. Um, we sent that out about a month ago now. Um, as far as uh, submittals, we had three. Um, those were from um, FHU with a uh, subconsultants, Fear and Peers, and Group Creative Services. Um, we had one from SRF with Alta Plane Design and Snyder and Associates as subs. And then finally, we had one from Tool Design with HR Green Confluence and HDR Engineering as their subs. So three really solid submittals um, that we received that we'll be reviewing. Um, uh, Chair Bob Andewig has named a selection committee. The list of those members is on your screen before you there. Um, we have Mark Holm from Ankeny, Marquita Oliver from Bondurant, Stephanie Riva from Norwalk, John Davis from the City of Des Moines, Eric Peterson from the City of West Des Moines, Luis Montoya from DART, and Jeremy Lewis from the Street Collective. Um, we feel like this is a really good cross-section of um, engineers and planners and uh, members of our policy committee and local experts on bike and ped type solutions. So uh, really happy with the, the selection committee and very happy that all of them accepted uh, that uh, nomination from Chair Andewig. Um, so in the coming weeks, they will be reviewing the um, submittals and scoring them. And then we'll be working to also uh, set up um, interviews for each one of these consulting firms. I believe some of this, these next steps are listed on the next slide, if you'll advance it, please. Um, so they will be reviewing those RFP responses, as I mentioned, um, scoring them. We're looking at trying to get those interviews scheduled for probably around late June, maybe early July. Um, we are still waiting to hear back from the US DOT on our uh, grant agreement. Um, we really won't be able to move forward until that grant agreement is finalized. We did want to get moving on getting our consultant selected so that once that grant agreement is finalized, we can just kind of hit the ground running um, on this project. So uh, the interviews will be conducted sometime at the end of this month or early in July um, so that we can have approval on the uh, um, August committee's 
for that consultant selection. Um, following the August approvals of that consultant, we will be able to move forward with negotiations um, with the uh, consultant team, the selected firm, um, as far as contracts and those kind of things. So that's uh, where we're sitting with the Comprehensive Safety Action Plan RFP right now. Just wanted to provide you with that update so you're aware of kind of what's happening over the next few weeks in regards to um, this big project that we'll be undertaking in the coming months. I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Hey, any questions for Zach? All right, hearing none. Thanks for that update, Zach. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that brings us to item 10, a report on upcoming events. Z, are you able to talk to that one? Yep, that'll be me. Thank you. We've prepared um, an updated list of upcoming events. I just want to bring your attention to some um, ones that we would like to highlight. Uh, we have the Governor's Highway Safety Traffic Conference in Des Moines uh, in a week or two at the uh, Holiday Inn Airport Center. Uh, we have the Iowa Counties Engineering Association uh, mid-year conference up in Ames, and also the TRB conference in Cedar Rapids um, later in July. Oh, and the Safe Roads to School uh, Summit later in October. That's uh, all, all I have. Okay, thank you, Z. Any questions for Z? Okay, hearing none, thanks, Z. Uh, that brings us to item 11. Uh, other non-action items of interest to the committee. Does anybody have any other items? Uh, Steve, I've got one. I just want to mention, uh, she's not on the call, but I don't believe, but Allison uh, Van Pelt from our staff will be leaving the MPO here soon. Um, so I just want to publicly thank her for all the work she's done for the MPO. Um, she's been a great asset to us over the last several years, and I know she'll be missed by us, and I'm sure uh, by many of you with the services she's provided with respect to environmental uh, sustainability related efforts, among the other things that she does. So just want to wish her well and let everybody know that uh, that that's happening. So kind of to be determined what we do with that position and in terms of filling it just in this interim time, um, but that'll be something decided later. Okay. All right, thanks, Dylan. Allison, thank you so much and, and wish you the best. Thank, thank you. So, all right, uh, that brings us to item 12. Our next meeting date is July 6th at 9.30 as your typical time. All right, so that brings us to the end of our agenda. Uh, please consider this meeting adjourned. Thank you.